I grew up uh, in the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains in uh, Earliesville, Virginia, right outside of Charlottesville. Grew up dirt poor, wrong side of the wrong side of the tracks. Um, you know, uh, dad was an alcoholic and a drug user. Uh, for the most part, he was absent. Um, I was the middle son, so no matter what happened, I always got beat for it. You know, being a middle child, so on and so forth, whether I had anything to do with it or not. Um, and going to school, you know, we went to a pretty nice school, actually. And we were, I mean, by far the poorest there, you know. So we got picked on, made fun of and stuff like that, and just started fighting, you know. I never bullied anybody, but I would always pick fights with the bullies because I hated it. I, you know, I know what it feel like to be put down and made fun of. So I would take the bullies, I'd stuff their heads in the toilets, you know. That's just all I've ever known was how to fight. My dad made me fight, you know, we sawed off two by fours just to toughen us up and make us hard. He said, if you get into a fight, you damn sure better finish it. And if you lose, I'm gonna beat your ass for it. That's pretty much, I mean, unfortunately, that's pretty much my childhood. You know, all I've ever known was violence. You know, it, it wasn't the solution to the problem. It was just life. Now I'm doing 1,214 years in the state of Virginia without parole. Um, that's pretty much it. Officer Patrick, can you take a call? I'm going to take your handcuffs off. Let us control your hands. thing that segregation means to me is extreme loneliness and boredom. That's the main thing, loneliness. You know, don't care how tough you are, I don't care how badass you are, you can Bruce Lee it up all day long. It gets to you, and it hurts like hell. Everybody's just 
basically walking over top of you. You can hear them, but they can't hear you. That's the way I feel. Forgotten. You know? And that is not a comfortable feeling at all. When you're alone, you tend to reflect on your thoughts a lot. You tend to maybe regress into yourself a lot. You just have nobody. You truly are alone. And anyone who says, you know, I would love to be alone, I don't think they've been alone. So. Because when they do, they'll experience it and they'll, they'll hate it. I've been in set going on eight years. And when you're in here, you don't have the contact that you want. Every time you leave the cell, you got a strip. For real. Squat it off. Notice in the bottoms of your feet. Other one. And then you're in handcuffs. You're in shackles. And you know you got a gun up there in the booth. While it's not necessarily pointed at you, it only takes a couple seconds. You get to go to the shower, you know, talk through the doors a little bit. You get to go outside on the red cages, you know, for an hour, a few days a week. So when you're in here, you're around hundreds of other guys. Inmates and the COs. But you walk alone. Red Onion was opened in August of 1998. Uh, it was opened to be a security level six segregation facility, Supermax, basically a totally locked down facility where most offenders remain in the cell 23 hours a day, seven days a week. I came here as assistant warden at the time. We opened the facility, we brought offenders in that had negative behavior. 
the worst behaving offenders in the state. And we brought them from other facilities to Red Onion to be able to house them in a more secure environment than the lower level facilities. My name is Michael Kelly. I'm originally from South Central Los Angeles. I don't know nobody out here. I don't have no family, no friends out here. I don't know a soul in Virginia. I came out here to Virginia to drop somebody off and I committed a couple robberies. And the courts in Virginia gave me 38 years for two armed robberies. If I would have known that I would have got 38 years for two armed robberies, like, I would have never done it. You know what I mean? Because I would have been like, holy shit, I'm not finna throw my life away for 38 years for two armed robberies. That's crazy. That sounds nuts. But I didn't know how serious it was out here in Virginia. In California, I would have got like eight years, not even that, you know? But <laughs> I didn't know how serious it was. And I didn't know how serious um, society took that. When I was a kid, I wanted to be a gangster. I wanted to be like my father. You know, in California, where I came from, we don't really look at gang banging as, as, as being crazy. It's just kind of our culture. It's a neighborhood thing. Like, if you're from the neighborhood, that's your family. You know, that's, that's, that's your family. That's everything to you. You know, when we're young, you got people that you look up to and say, you want to be like them. You know, I want to be like him. Like, look at this car, you know. Look at the girls that like him. Like, I want to be like him. I want to look like him when I get older. That's my America. And I'm in prison now. And they put me in segregation for fighting. And being in that cell 23 hours a day, it's a mental challenge in itself. Just being in that cell for so long, it, 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 it's a psychological thing, you know? Any and everything that we go through is just in that little box, in that little cell. Trying to like create things to do. Trying to keep from going crazy, like every day, all day. Like for me, my therapeutic time is cleaning up every day. When I get up in the morning, I clean up. When I go to bed at night, I clean up. You know, hit the floor, the wall, the sink, just clean everything, get it all straight, spick and span, right? But I don't know, I think that's just maybe OCD or something, I don't know. Maybe I'm crazy a little bit. The COs can't really understand, you know what I mean? They're here half the time we're here, you know what I mean? But at the same time, they leave, you know, and they go back into the real world and they come back. This is our world. Tracking the development of a winter storm here along the east coast and just starting to see some snow in the north and south Dakotas, a bitter cold Arctic air from the south. That ends the warmer air to the southeast and then we get that storm developing, so it's just initially starting to develop now. Temperatures are dropping.
Give me all your clothes. Some days it can be easy going, and then some days your stress level can be out the roof. And it feels like you're doing time, because you have to come right back and do it the next morning. But you make what? You make the best of it. And in order to maintain control, you have to be firm. Face the back wall, spread your butt cheeks, squat and call. Working in the Supermax prison, it'll definitely make you tougher. 28! Maintaining, you know, your, your calm is, is quite an achievement when dealing with some of these guys. And some days it feels like the day's just not going to end. You know, it's one thing right after another. I'm a unit manager of the building. I've been with the Department of Corrections now for 16 years. I started as an officer, and I was promoted to sergeant, then to lieutenant, then unit manager. The hard part for some staff is because they're on such great alert 12 hours a day, and there's the potential for violence. When you go home and it's time to relax, sometimes it's hard to let your mind yeah. Relax, because you're still definitely on yeah. guard. So I think that adds to the stress of this profession. You look at things different. Uh, when I'm out on vacation or out in big crowds with my family, you know, I'm always looking around. Yeah. I think that's to do with this job. You have to just let red onion be red onion, you know, and it takes, a, a, it takes experience to really settle in to the point that you realize this is just a job, you know? We don't have to live here. Uh, my name is Lars Hansen. Um, I'm a lifer. I have a life sentence. And life in Virginia means uh, life without parole. You're, you're in. And uh, uh, people who have a release date, uh, their mentality is different than an individual like myself who, where we have life. It's, it's life. And it's, it's, it's very impact. It's, it's uh, <laughs> it's depressing, it's sad, it's, uh, uh, it can really overwhelm you. So when you have to live with that year on end, year on end, um, you know, it, it can take a toll on you. I'm 41 years old. Uh, I've been incarcerated here in Virginia for almost 20 years now. I started getting in trouble, you know, nothing major. Was, I guess uh, probably 13 years old. But I come from good parents. You know, they loved me. Uh, you know, they didn't beat me. They, uh, they taught me to respect people. And uh, I have a brother who lives in Texas. And we're just alike. It's just that I, I made the bad choices, and he didn't, and, you know, he's doing really well. When I was 17, uh, I shot a guy, and I did five and a half years in prison in Hagerstown. And I think that kind of messed me up a little bit, because it's very violent out there. I told the parole board this, they paroled me. And so I went home, age 22, and I was home for six months, but I still had the mind frame of an inmate. Uh, mentality when you're incarcerated is you don't want anybody to really disrespect you or take advantage of you or, uh, you, know, you know, stuff like that. And um, so um, 
I was at a gas station with my girlfriend, and there's uh, two guys that just kept harassing my girlfriend and I, and uh, they just kept on, kept on, and kept on, and kept on, and I snapped, and uh, I stabbed them, and I killed them, and they gave me a life sentence. I mean, I'm up here for attempted escape. All right, I actually scaled the fence, and I could cut up real bad. Uh, I got myself stuck in the fence. Uh, I bled out, I woke up on the chopper, uh, and then they medevaced me, saved my life, brought me to Red Onion. And I've been here in the segregation ever since then. Segregation is tricky on the inmate. Because if the inmate is not careful, they adapt to it. And they start becoming antisocial and become crazy. They can lose their mind. Ask yourself, can you live in a bathroom for 10 years? It's bad to lock a, an individual up and just put them in a, in a room, a closed, you know, nothing to do. It's, 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 I guess you could say inhumane. And I know that we're inmates and all, all, all you're in, but it, it, excuse my language, it fucks me up. I've been in segregation going on 17 years. But I've been locked up for 27 years. And do you mind telling me about the original charge you caught? Armed robberies. And I, I shot one person in the armed robbery with malicious wounding. Well, I didn't shoot him. It was uh, I shot up in the air, told him to get on the ground. And the bullet ricocheted off the steel eye beam in the ceiling ricocheted off the brick wall and hit the cashier in the foot. And they gave me 30 years for that. <laughs> a ricochet bullet that didn't have no intent to hurt nobody. I shot up in the air. They, they even testified I shot up in the air. But the judge didn't see it that way. He said and my intent to hurt was when I pulled that trigger. So, and, and what happened that got you to into segregation for such a long time? I cut the warden across the face and the neck in uh, 19, December 26th of 1996. I did that. That wasn't, that wasn't too good. That was a moment of passion. <laughs> That's something I've been regretting for the last 17 years almost. In 1986, when I did my crimes, I had papers saying, if I do 10 years, then I can apply for parole. And then in 1995, they come up with this new law that says I don't get no parole. And it changed my whole life, my whole outlook on life. That made me snap. They took my parole in 95, and I stabbed the warden in 96. They sent me up here, and I've been in segregation since. I come in the prison system, you know, fighting, slinging ink, hustling, doing whatever. So I'm in population, and my cellmate tells me, look, man, you got a guy going around telling his dudes that he's going to rape me. He said he's going to knock you out. He's going to rape you. I said, okay, if I had a knife, I'd slit that boy's throat. He said, I'll make you one. We used to have uh, cassette tapes back then. You know, the plastic case around it? Took it, broke the stuff off, took a lighter, melted it, folded it in half. Did that with another one. Melted it together. We put three brand new razors in it and melted it in there. Next morning, we walk out, and he's crossed the yard. I walk up behind a dude, take my left hand, I wrap it, and I palm his face. Put my right knee in his lower back, and I stretch him back. I slit his throat from ear to ear. His friend said, oh my God, no. He dove like Superman and rolled up, jumped up, and ran across the yard. So when dude turned around, because it didn't really cut him deep, because you, you, cutting throats ain't easy, because you got all the ligaments and tendons in there. It's it's a lot tougher than people think it is. 
you know, but he bleeding like a stuck pig. So when he turns around, I just start catching him, beat the living hell out of him. They come run up on me, you know, before they can tackle me and whatnot. I just step up, step back, because I didn't put the work in. You know, they put the handcuffs on me, they take them, they bring me up here. Those rows are still not even. Make them even. We have six offenders on mental health precautions. Their SMI sheet should be on their door listing specifically what the uh, management instructions are for mental health. We now have the Glock 40 calibers uh, in position. So make sure you have your weapons card. Um, I think that's all I've got. Everything else should uh, be normal. Have a safe and peaceful day, and thank you. Tell me how Goodman's acting this morning. He came out of restraints last night about 12.30 and uh, waiting to get his property back to be reviewed. He's already got it. He's already got his property back. Um, he's still a little agitated. What you got running today? Things are running smooth. Um, officers are doing well. We are on lock. Anything about when we would have Zoom wreck? Not as of now. Okay. Well. Once somebody starts in corrections, they quickly learn that they do make a difference. You know, it's law enforcement. Um, Every day we're protecting the public. We save lives, and uh, you know that that's fulfilling to you. You know you get to go home and lay your head down at night and think about what you've done today, and realize that you did make a difference, and that you can make a difference. In this area, you'll see a lot of uh, coal mines. Uh, for years, that was the uh, career that everybody was drawn to because it was readily available. Sawmills, not a lot of high-end jobs in this area. Then uh, when Red Onion Prison opened, you know, there was a lot of job opportunities. And at that time, there was a, a lot of coal mines that were shutting down. People were being laid off. So a lot of the people that initially started at these places were people that were coming from the coal mines. My father's still working in the coal mines. This is his 40th year working in mines. You know, I was, I was raised in a mining family, and that's really, in this area, that's the, the biggest and really about the only industry. That working, that red onion, it's tough, but to me it's a good job compared to the coal mines. The unit managers make rounds daily to see the status of every offender in the building. You've got to know the offenders in your housing units. What's up with your situation? Yeah, go over to the door right here. You. When was your charge? Charge was in January. Over okay. Here for a 212 charge. That don't even qualify. What is a 212 charge? A threatening bodily harm charge. A threatening bodily Who did you threaten? He ain't threatening nobody. The officer said he overheard me talking to somebody. He won't give me my property back. He won't give me nothing back. You know, at each door, each fender has a different problem. And, you know, they all want the answer yes. Before 10 o'clock in the morning, right? I done told him he just me. 
but yes is not the answer that they'll always get. No, they did not. Man. And I believe that we have a number of offenders that segregation is what the is what they want, is where, is where they want to live. They're afraid for reasons they may be afraid living in, to live in general population. And then you've got some in here that just refuse to participate. What's going on? I'm just trying to get back home to Texas, man. How was what you did last week going to get you back home to Texas? If an offender acts out or misbehaves, there's consequences to that. If an inmate continues to act up or become disruptive, then that's when we take disciplinary action. What did you do last week? Did you flood, break, sprinkler head? Why, why did you break the sprinkler head? You feel better now? But you feeling a little bit better now than you was last week? That's the last time I got your meal. Feeling better today, honey? I got mental illness on the field, mental ill, psychotic and erotic, and all being denied on suspicion. You're psychotic and erotic, is that what you said? Yeah, psychotic and erotic. That's a person that all uh, symptom out of touch with reality. Don't know what's uh chivalry, what's real, and what's uh spurious and fake, and some of the torture techniques, like strapping prison to the bed with that useless uh chest strap starving. Well, I take a lot of we gonna go on about our business. Right. And look, also, they got me in prison with no evidence. They had no eyewitness, and um, the state found me guilty, and they had a lot of people with that like that. At Red Onion, an offender would start out at level zero. That would be you get your wreck in the showers, uh, and your food, and, and all the basic requirements of life you get the very minimum. If you behave, have your cells in compliance, you're cooperative with the staff, you will go to level one. And at that point, you may pick up an electronic item, you may pick up a few more dollars of commissary. Uh, if the offender continues to cooperate, he can go to level two, you know, where he will pick up more privileges. They may have some more commissary, of course they get their TV, I love the TV because I feel like that's the only contact with life that I have, you know what I mean, as far as with the outside world, you know? I did 13 months straight without a television, and um, I cherish it. I cherish my TV now. I seen this show the other day on Discovery Channel. This dude was building tree houses. He was building tree houses up in trees, but they was like little mini mansions, little tree houses. He had spaceships and all kinds of shit. I'm like, wow. I wish I'd have went to an art school, for real, man. When I get up in the morning, I catch the shows on TV, watch the local news, watch uh, Married with Children, all that old stuff early in the morning. But sometimes I watch a movie and see something in the movie, brings back memories that reminds me that I'm missing out on things that I used to do. I get upset about it. I cut the TV off or switch the channels or whatever. You know that show Bear Grylls? Uh, I mean, he does basically what I call uh, survival camping. You know, he'll go out there with just, you know, a knife and the clothes on his back and pretty much nothing else, and he just lives off the land. I love that stuff. I, I grew up doing it. I lived in the woods. When I come home from school, I wasn't watching TV. I was out in the woods. You know, I would climb in trees and throwing myself down mountains and, you know, jumping off of cliffs and rock climbing. I love that stuff. I miss it. And, you know, they got frosted glass on the window so we can't see out. Can't see trees or anything. Ninety percent of the offenders in Virginia return to the public, return to your communities. Previously, offenders that have been in segregation for quite a few years would go straight to the probation office. We would take the restraints off of him. Then he would be sent back to society. And we'd expect him 
to adjust to being in the public. And now our goal is to take the restraints off here, to take the risk inside the facility so the risk is not taken in the public. To get out of segregation, they must participate in our step-down program. We're start going over some things used to help us deal with our anger. The question I'm going to ask is, how you learned to express anger all your life? So how did you learn to express anger? This is going to be in module three, and out three. Do you think we learn how to express anger? Do you think that's something learned? I mean, I learned more or less from, 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 from my environment, the people I'm around. I grew up in a, in a rough neighborhood. You had to fight or As you grew up, you learned to find ways to get what you wanted from people. Sometimes this involved violence, intimidation, or physical and emotional abuse. Many men in prison are there as a result of the lessons they have learned when growing up. We're trying to prepare them to be successful in a population setting. Offenders that have graduated through the program will go from a segregation environment into a population environment. You need the challenge series. This is it. No, that's the anger management. Hey, hey, if you got a psycho program, that means that somebody is a psychiatrist. Okay. So why I'm not released, I'm here for 10 years. You've got one more program to complete. How is that the program? I'm right here. Yeah, you gotta, once you complete the challenge program, then after you complete it, you'll go to Deanville. I've been here for seven years. I've been in segregation because they gave me nine charges to keep me back here. They refused to allow me to progress in the step Kelly. It's been seven years since I've had a fight with anybody. Seven years. I think I'm doing pretty damn good. I'll get up with you on that. We'll talk about it. Right. I understand that in any type of environment, whether it's in the free world or in prison, you have to have rules and regulations. We all understand that. You have to have rules. Otherwise, it'd be chaotic in here. It would be crazy. But when you actually have a valid problem if you have a valid issue it's not heard and it's like you have no voice and being a person and having no voice it hurts at times you know Thank mm -hmm. you. 